everybody. My name is Jody Pacone. You are watching Community Resources. I am a licensed social worker with the state of Massachusetts and I work for the Department of Children and Families. Today my guest is Senator O'Connor Ives. Thank you very much for being on the show this evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Senator is, has covered seven uh, communities in her district, including Haverhill, and has been extremely instrumental in Harbor Place and a lot of things that are happening. And because she is up on the hill, and we have done so many shows here for Community Resources about the opiate epidemic, I felt that it was really important to have her on our show because there's been a lot of legislative change happening up on the Hill. I think that you folks are extremely dedicated to coming at this opiate epidemic in a very different way than maybe some other communities are and I truly and greatly appreciate that and wanted to really bring that to Haverhill so that they understand what our legislation is doing for us. Sure. Um, so we'll just go right into it. Uh, one of the most important things that Governor Baker has recently passed, um, I think that there's, we use acronyms a lot. We've talked about this on the show before. You know, we might know what they mean. Um, I think this is referred to as STEP, which mm -hmm. is uh, Substance Use Treatment Education Prevention. And um, that legislation just came into effect, which really folks at home should know this is the first piece of legislation in the U.S. that has kind of come out like this. So really applauding the Hill and the governor and you guys as legislators to pass this. So when I talk to the audience about what that is, if you could give us a little bit of an explanation about what this really means about limiting prescriptions and that sure. type of stuff. I'll be happy to. And the legislature in this session passed this bill, which is largely focused on addiction prevention and improved prescribing habits. Mm -hmm. The previous bill that we did was really focused on expanding treatment options yeah. because we know that there are far too many instances where someone might be seeking a bed and there's no bed available, yeah. or they get into a quagmire of insurance coverage, not getting the coverage they need to access a detox program. Right. So that prior bill came into effect this past October. And on the heels of that, the House of Representatives and the Senate knew that there needed to be a second bill to focus on the reality, the, the stark reality, which is that very often serious addiction and often death is at the starting point with a legal prescription drug. Right. or the misuse of a legally prescribed drug. Yep. So Representative uh, Brian Dempsey in the House, uh, Representative Linda Dean Campbell, Representative Diana DiZoglio, uh, we, all, we all represent Haverhill and you know it's really important for the public to appreciate that you, you need three pieces to pass any bill or else it's just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. It needs to pass the House, it yep. needs to pass the Senate, yep. and the governor needs to sign Sorry. it. And for this issue of opioid abuse, all three steps have happened with both pieces of legislation. And like you were saying, this most recent bill is so critical because what we're finding is that America is a huge outlier with its access to narcotics. Yeah. And what happens is, is that people are either not getting the information they need when they begin it, or it's getting into the wrong hands. So this bill does a couple of important things, notably, for the initial prescription, it's only a seven-day supply with that written prescription. Mm -hmm. And that struck a balance between not wanting to create an addicting environment, but also providing enough in that initial prescription to meet that patient's needs. Right, because tr people truly do need some of this medication, mm -hmm. but for how long do you need it? And this way here, this gives much more control to the prescriber and much more flexibility or I should say lack of flexibility for somebody that's going to misuse a medication. It's really interesting because there was so much debate from both the medical field, mm. uh, first responders, so many people that have had hands-on experience with this problem. Mm -hmm. So seven days for that initial prescription but at the same time when someone receives that prescription they can actually say that I want to partially fill it 
for ongoing prescriptions because as you know in the past someone might receive a prescription for 30 pills or mm -hmm. 50 pills yep. and they don't know what the standard course of the medication is but because of this legislation you can now say when you go to the pharmacy even though this was written for 30 pills I would like 15 and I know that my next prescription has to be handwritten again but I'd rather have just the 15 and go back instead of just taking all 30 or just taking 15 and having the 15 extra ones unused lying around to either be stolen or improperly disposed of. Well, I think that that's such an important piece for the audience to really hear and focus on too because not only is the individual that's being prescribed medication possibly not understanding or misusing a medication, but I think that one of the things that I've seen working with the Department of Children and Families and working much more focused with children is that we've got children and adolescents as young as 12 years old uh, taking those additional remaining leftover medications sitting in a grandparent's medicine cabinet, right. their own family's medicine cabinet, or their own medications, and even if they might not be misusing them themselves, selling them. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole element in so many different areas in regards to use, distribution, sale, that to me this is just wonderful. So that is a great piece of, you know, th they thoughtfully had those conversations with all of those providers and the community. So this was not just legislation saying, hey, we think this is a good thing to do. So that, that is just remarkable, remarkable. It's important because we all know that that's a critical point of contact between yeah. the patient and the provider in terms of what is the right fit. And there's a provision I advocated for that would require the provider at the point of prescribing it to articulate, to tell the patient what the risks are yeah. of that drug being consumed. Because sometimes the patient might not fully be aware that there's a spectrum of pain. And maybe you need that medication for before you go to bed but maybe you'd only need Tylenol during the day. Yeah. And to be empowered with the information that you need to know, okay, when is that window where I could actually become addicted? Is it five days? Is it 10 days, yeah. right? Yeah. So to create that urgency, the dialogue needs to happen right there because mm -hmm. after the person's addicted, it's a lot harder to undo. That's right, that's right. And um, um, you know what else I should mention on that whole category of um, prescribing? I know that you were interested in terms of uh, the real directives for reducing the access to opioids. Yes. I think it's important to also mention that there's new provisions in here for the prescription drug monitoring program mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the state has it, but now this requires prescribers to check that database if they have any concerns because it has that person's whole prescription history. Mm -hmm. I know that you were concerned about the issue of doctor shopping and things like that. Absolutely, because in, in my line of work, in social work, this is something that we truly do see, whether it is someone going to a dentist and then going to a chiropractor and then going to a primary care and then going to a mental health specialist. So, you know, this could be a, let's say, a parent that I'm working with through the department on my caseload, and what we see is that shopping and we don't necessarily know that right up front. So it's a lot harder to kind of get at those pieces to truly understand, hey, this is not a person that kind of had a one-time episode. This truly is a prolonged addiction and a pattern of addiction, and we can see that through some of this doctor shopping. And I know that some states don't have this registry and don't have this system, so for folks to know that Massachusetts does have this prescription registry um, is, is really a good thing for Massachusetts, um, and now that they're mandated to utilize that mm -hmm. is, is wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Great piece to add add to the legislation. And there's also a piece in regards to Narcan, I think, in there, correct? So there was another related issue about how first responders were hitting a wall because often Narcan was only accessible through grant programs mm -hmm. where police departments or fire departments would apply for these grants. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't have to compete against each other for access. And the other unfortunate thing that was happening is that the price was escalating just for them to access the drug. Yep. 
So the legislature put in last year's budget funding for a bulk purchasing program so that municipalities could purchase this Narcan through the Department of Public Health and that has two important benefits. One, the department can better track the application of the Narcan right. for, for data collecting to figure out how much is being used, how many lives are being saved and things of that nature. But the actual costs were really shocking in terms of um, the actual doses. Some towns were reporting that they were paying between $33 and $67 a dose for mm. Narcan. And with the bulk purchasing trust fund, the price is now at about $20 a dose. So I think that the cities and towns shouldn't be saddled with having a scramble to keep yeah. this in stock. So that was another important provision. And you know, I think that there's been a lot of uh, controversy about this. I've heard dialogue from both sides in regards to um, people thinking that it's going to make it easier for an addict to say, well, it's okay if I overdose because somebody's gonna have Narcan. But I really want to stress to our audience, if this is your child that is in front of you in your home overdosing, if this is your spouse, if this is your family member or your friend, you are going to want Narcan. Mm -hmm. So people may hold a position or an opinion about it, but I really want to stress to folks that this is a life-saving medication that is administered currently you know this form of Narcan is administered through a nasal spray it is not dangerous to children it is not an addictive substance so this is very different than some other things I think that we've had in the past um, people relate it to Suboxone, Methadone, you know, those types of things. And Narcan really is meant to be a life-saving medication. And if you are the person that has someone overdosing in front of you that is your loved one, you want that. Yes. <clears throat> um, people can actually access Narcan. I've spoken and I actually had the founder of Learn to Cope, Joanne Peterson, on a show before and Learn to Cope is now in Haverhill. Um, so that started last September of 2015. Um, and you can attend a Learn to Cope session, which is held on Thursday evenings from seven o'clock to 8.30. They were meeting at Northern Essex, but there's some renovations taking place there now. So actually Learn to Cope here in Haverhill is now meeting at Sacred Heart Church on Thursday evenings, still starting at seven o'clock till 8.30. And I know that Joanne's organization and Learn to Cope got a grant, mm -hmm. actually from the Department of Public Health, mm -hmm. and they will administer, um, they will release doses of Narcan so that a parent, a spouse, or a family member can actually go home with Narcan. There's an educational session about how to use it. Um, so it's really a wonderful program that I think that some of this legislation gave assistance with that bulk purchasing program as well. So it's, it's really starting to impact the community um, in such a positive way. One of the concerns that I had about this legislation was kind of unintended consequences. So when policy gets made, there may be a period of time that there are some things that have a little bit of a negative response based on this kind of getting rolled out and the implementation. And one of the things that I was concerned about for the summer being also an emergency responder for the Department of Children and Families, you know, are we gonna see that now that the prescriptions are so limited to people were getting 30 days, sometimes 60 days supplies of some of these opiates and now they're only getting seven days, do we have a bulk part of the population that may be on the borderline of being addicted or have a prescription drug addiction? Now they can't get that prescription because it's limited the way that it is through the new legislation. I'm kind of thinking, you know, will we see half of those people seek help and do the appropriate things to, you know, not be addicted? And will we see half of those people leave the prescription part of the addiction and go to heroin street use. So that's a huge concern that I've kind of had, and I didn't know if legislators had any of that conversation or. Yeah, I think, I think <clears throat> what's important to distinguish is that the bill says that initial prescription is seven days, mm -hmm. and that is 
prior to when someone might become addicted. It's yeah. not as extended to already have an addicting situation. Mm -hmm. So then it requires that patient to go back to the prescriber or the provider to get a second prescription. They have to go back in person and, and have that. Physically get they a do. paper prescription. No more calling it into the pharmacy. No more the doctor faxing it over to the pharmacy. Um, I, I think that's great. So when they get that second prescription, that's based on a conversation they've had with the nurse or the doctor. Yeah. And that prescription is not going to be for a seven day limit if the provider feels like it's merited. Mm -hmm. It could be for two weeks, it could be for a month. If somebody's had a surgical procedure, yeah. somebody's had um, a serious condition, then it's going to be validated. They're gonna get the prescription that they need. I think that what this does is it increases the accountability for the prescriber in that patient-doctor interaction. Yeah. So if there's a situation where it's bona fide, merited pain management, that can happen. There's no there's no limit on that. There's no seven day limit after that initial prescription. They just okay. have that incentive to go back in order okay. to get that continued treatment. Yep. Okay. Um, there's also something that's written into the legislation in regards to our school systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I'm thrilled about because the earlier we start, in my opinion, the better off we are. This is also about educating, preventing, and that right. piece is in this legislation. It is. And um, a few communities in our area were already doing what's called um, SBIRT screenings. Mm -hmm. So it's not a drug screening where there's a urine analysis or a blood analysis right. or anything like that. It's literally a couple of questions where the school nurse or another skilled technician would interact with the students once a year. Mm -hmm. um, communities like Northampton, um, North Andover, and our neck of the woods have already implemented this. Mm -hmm. And there would be oversight from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, where there are simply some basic prompting questions in terms of consumption of alcohol, tobacco, legal or illicit drugs yep. to create that dialogue. Now it doesn't mean that that young person is going to divulge everything under the sun, right. but it's a very important interface to see if there's an opportunity for intervention at these young ages where mm -hmm. the statistics really show that addiction begins in the middle and high school levels yeah. overwhelmingly. And if there isn't going to be that interface, then we're missing a huge window of opportunity to prevent a lot of destruction. Right, right. So there is great things happening in Massachusetts around these pieces. Um, another really important legislative change that has taken place, I think I may have very briefly spoken about Section 35. When a family member, um, which actually there are a few different roles that a person plays in a person's life, that they could actually request this Section 35. Um, and this is when we're seeing family members or loved ones that the addiction, they possibly may have already had an overdose and are at risk of overdosing again. We know that with addiction, there may be issues around mental health, they're at suicide risk, or the addiction has just gotten so bad that this person truly, every time that they are either using, uh, whether it be alcohol, prescription drugs, heroin, any of these aspects, are truly putting their life at risk and a family member has the ability to go to court, file the Section 35, and request that this person be held for anywhere up to 90 days. It's usually on average about 30 days, but it truly means they could be held for 90 days. The important legislative change that has recently been made, women that were in this category were actually being sent to MCI Framingham Prison. And that is so inappropriate. This is a person that needs treatment, and instead they're very criminalized and stigmatized and sent to, Massachusetts only has one main facility as far as criminal facilities, you know, Department of Correction for Women is MCI. So now this legislation says we can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk to us a little bit about what our options are for women where families truly are concerned about them and may be able to section them. This was a really important component, like you said. You don't want to have a disincentive for 
yeah. members of the community, for family, for court officials to not want to send women and prevent them from fatally overdosing because they know that their only alternative is a prison. Right. So what happened, and uh, the governor actually mentioned it in his state of the state address, mm -hmm. which was exciting, the fact that in this bill, the House and the Senate wanted to make sure that practice ended. So, of course, to do it right, it took a little bit more funding. Mm -hmm. So there was a supplemental budget of $5.8 million so that Taunton State Hospital could be that alternative mm -hmm. for civilly committed women. And, and that's critical because if they're going to be sent to a place for 30 days, 60 days like you're describing, it can't be prison yeah. if it's an addiction problem. Yeah. So fortunately, that was a complete change yeah. for, for better outcomes. And um, I think everyone on Beacon Hill is really proud of that change because it was an issue people had talked about for so long. Mm -hmm. But with this legislation, it's now been done. Yeah. So that's really important. And um, on that topic of women and treatment, I also wanted to update the audience members that here in our own county, in Essex County, Sheriff Cousins has an initiative where he created a 42-bed detox facility in Middleton, mm -hmm. in the House of Corrections, which is a totally new model. And they have the environment that's needed so that it doesn't feel like you're in prison, but you're actually in detox. Yeah. All of these people are all pretrial waiting. So they could have been in a cell, and now they're getting the proper medical treatment that they need. And it's really successful where they are churning out folks that are maintaining their sobriety. Mm -hmm. And because it's been so successful, they're actually replicating that for women who are pretrial and developing a 42-bed detox center for them, which is going to be opening in the first week of July. Oh, that is great news, great news. Uh, so family members that are at home and hopefully watching uh, the show, please understand that you really do have options. I've heard from families, I've tried everything. And then I've had a dialogue with them, you know, have you ever tried to section this family member? Um, a lot of people don't even know about this available, you know, tool for them to really kind of keep that family member safe. Um, it can be a little bit daunting. I think that it's very difficult and very embarrassing for people. You know, one of the uh, things that I wanted people to take a look at was um, the website that Massachusetts has actually created, which is, uh, what is the name of it? Stigma, um, hashtag, so you can actually use hashtag state without stigma, or you could actually go to mass.gov and look up state without stigma. And there is a plethora of resources there and information there. But the reality is addiction has stigma and people are very embarrassed, very, it's very shameful. And I think that um, it might be very difficult for folks to say, oh my God, I have to go in front of a judge, I have to go in front of the court. Uh, but the courts really are very empathetic and are trying to make this as um, compassionate of a process as they can. I've actually been with a couple of family members to go through this process. So for folks that may think, I've, I've tried everything, really this is something that is a tool for you to be able to use because you're going to know that for at least 30 days your family member is safe and there's also controversy that i've had people you know have a dialogue about this well but you're forcing somebody into treatment but when you're looking to save someone's life this right. is not just someone that is drinking six beers a day and you think that they're an alcoholic or you know something you know of, of that type of nature this is addiction to the point that you know this person has either previously overdosed is at risk of overdosing again or their alcohol consumption or whatever choice of substance that they're consuming their life truly is at risk that is what a section 35 at your local district court is really all about um, so I really encourage folks at home to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, to have you folks up on the hill noticing 
these issues and what pieces are blocking people from seeking help. Um, you know, kudos to everybody up there and our greatest appreciation for social workers that are doing this work and substance abuse treatment providers. Uh, this is crucial to what the community needs to start getting ahead of this epidemic. Well, thank you for what you do and your expertise and focus on this issue. I, I want to mention that Senator Flanagan, who is one of the 40 senators on Beacon Hill mm -hmm. who chairs a number of relevant committees has been hyper focused on this issue for mm -hmm. many many years and has become a real expert in our body um, in terms of what our next step should be and she's been involved in the development of this legislation as well and very active in terms of uh, reforming section 35 so it can be as yeah. effective as possible but this circles back to your point about Narcan and the fact that folks might be judgmental in terms of different programs mm. but when it comes to addiction what people are looking for both the person suffering for addiction and the family and loved ones is time mm -hmm. they need time to save that person's life and yeah. maybe it's another chance at Narcan which still requires hospitalization by the way it's not a silver bullet you have to get follow-up treatment you're not free and clear after it's administered you're still in jeopardy or something like a section 35 because it can be a lifelong battle it, everyone knows someone who's addicted and, yeah. and what they need is time to recover. Yeah. Um, on a previous show I have actually talked about a movie called Anonymous People and one of the things that was so poignant about a piece in there was a woman that contracted breast cancer and she was a recovering alcoholic and she said when I left my doctor's office there was a huge billboard in the hallway that said we follow you through we support you through your recovery and she said, I didn't quite understand what that was. And when I went to the doctors the next time, I said, well, what does that really mean? And he said, well, we have support groups after your chemotherapy. We have researchers that are going to be contacting you to follow you through months after your therapies and um, make sure you're doing well and, you know, how things are going. And she said, why don't we do that in regards to addiction? She said, you know, we don't think of these things along those terms. We release people from a detox. We release people from an addiction treatment facility. And there's no major follow-up. So, you know, this is really a whole shift. Not only do we have the stigma and the shame that's attached to things, but we really need to look at all of these pieces, I think, that legislation is really starting to. The prevention, the education, the follow-up, the, you know, holding people accountable in regards to prescribers and, and that type of piece. So I, I think there's tons of work to do, but I think that we're getting closer and closer and these pieces really do send a statement to our community and our state. One uh, stakeholder in all of this that we haven't talked too much about but is uh, critical, and I know that you know this, the actual manufacturers of the drugs. Yeah and they profit greatly from the yes, production of addicting medication. And um, in the bill, there's more robust requirements for them to take the responsibility onto themselves to develop take-back programs, mm -hmm. whether it's through the mail or through drop boxes. But the onus should be on them. Yeah. And if they don't do it, uh, the state will respond in turn. So there are requirements that they up their game in terms of take-back. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, folks, we're wrapping up there. Um, I wanted to remind people that you can go to Learn to Cope. So that is L-E-A-R-N and the, le the number two, C-O-P-E. Uh, Learn to Cope has a website. If you really are embarrassed to go to a support group, uh, it's all peer-led, it's all volunteers. Narcan can actually be obtained and you can get educated about Narcan there, but you can also go on their website. Um, so that is a resource for you in the community. Um, there is also, you know, with with the epidemic, there are so many grandparents raising their grandchildren from this. And um, you'll see on the show, grandparents raising grandchildren, um, massgrg.gov is uh, .com is actually one of their websites and you'll see that on the screen I believe as well. Um, so that's something else that I see as one of the consequences from this. 
we have got more children being raised by their grandchildren through this opiate ep epidemic right now, uh, which is a huge issue uh, for the Department of Children and Families. Um, so I thank you so much for coming on the show and really educating us and being so committed to what's going on. I, I really appreciate all that you folks are doing in, in the city and on the Hill. We're happy to, and I wanted to close by mentioning that folks can call our office. All of our contact information is on the state Senate website, but many times people will call our office looking for a treatment bed, looking to navigate mass health or some other insurance problem. Mm -hmm. So my office is available to people if they need help cutting through red tape or connecting the dots in terms of accessing treatment. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. This was a great show. Folks, have a good evening and look forward to seeing you on our next show. You've been watching Community Resources, and our guest is Senator O'Connor Ives. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs>